A Hubei resident publicly sued the Hubei government for covering up the CCP virus spreading. That night, he was summoned by police. China's economy shrinks for the first time since records began three decades ago, its GDP falling nearly 7 percent. Chinese authorities revised the virus death count in Wuhan, increasing it by 50 percent. Many believe the new number is still too low. Governments around the world demand the truth from China. They want to know how the virus originated and say it may have come from a lab in Wuhan. The G7 joins the call to reform the World Health Organization as Republican lawmakers call for its director general to resign. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. China's economy shrinks for the first time since record began three decades ago. Its GDP fell almost 7 percent in the first quarter. Factories across China shut down and exports fell. Many countries re-evaluating their trading relationship with China. Even though Chinese authorities are urging companies to reopen, many analysts believe economic activity will remain low. An American economist tweeting China's GDP figures show a depression rate of economic collapse. Chinese authorities are trying everything to get companies back to work. But many factories have no orders and many people have been laid off. One factory needed 50 new workers, 500 turned up for the interview. Since the beginning of 2020, over 5,000 movie and TV companies in China have closed down. That's an 80 percent increase versus the same time in 2019. And Chinese authorities revised the death count in Wuhan from about 2,600 to about 3,900, an increase of 50 percent. The official reason is late reports, missed reports or false reports. However, many say it's still very far from the real number. Chinese Caixin Net revealed that one funeral home received 5,000 urns in just two days. That's 1,000 more than the revised death count. One Chinese netizen writes, the authority should launch an official website publishing the details of the deceased, so then family members of anyone who is not on this list can raise questions. This list can be continually updated, so we can eventually get an accurate figure. But would the CCP dare to do this? If they did, wouldn't people be able to tell their figures are fake? Six cities in China are considered potential hotspots for the next outbreak, but the people in these six cities may not know it themselves. According to photos from Chinese social media, at one airport in southern China, people arriving from Wuhan or five other specific cities were told to take a different route than other passengers. On two airport arrival forms, passengers are asked if they are coming from the six places mentioned above. One of the six cities is Guangzhou. One resident writing, I only found out Guangzhou was a hotspot after reading chat room posts. The control measures are still very loose here. Many people don't even wear face masks anymore. Most people here don't know the situation is so serious. None of my colleagues know. Over the past few days, we reported on the situation in three of the six hotspot cities, Wuhan, Guangzhou and Suifenhe at the Chinese-Russian border. This April 15th video from Suifenhe City shows many shops preparing to close. The person taking the video says the authorities say all shops except food shops need to close. World leaders are increasing pressure on China, frustrated by the lack of transparency of the virus origin. But inside China, many people believe the virus came from the U.S. A Wuhan resident told Radio Free Asia on Friday the propaganda department has been pushing the narrative that the virus came from the U.S. and are repeating it nonstop. Now, more and more people believe it's true. He told RFA 80 to 90 percent of people there believe the propaganda and trying to convince them otherwise doesn't work. China's Global Times editor-in-chief boasted on Chinese social media that he mocked U.S. officials on Twitter. This comes after U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper on Thursday questioned the information coming out of China. Hu Xijing wrote on Weibo that he mocked Esper, saying only seven people died in Shanghai, which neighbors Wuhan, while more than 10,000 people have died in New York on the other side of the world. But instead of getting praise, he came under attack. Many netizens asked how come he had access to Twitter when the rest of China does not, adding Chinese authorities should allow everyone in China to use it. 
A growing movement is taking the Internet by storm as Thailand joins Taiwan and Hong Kong in solidarity against Beijing. But they've taken a unique approach, rallying together behind Milk Tea to form the Milk Tea Alliance. The movement was sparked after young Chinese nationalists, known as Little Pink, accused a young Thai actor and his model girlfriend of voicing support for Hong Kong and Taiwan online and attacked them. Soon, many Thais rallied together to protest China's authoritarian regime. The Milk Tea Alliance was among the top trending in Thailand on Wednesday. Netizens say it's the first time Thailand has joined forces with Hong Kong and Taiwan to battle China's 50-cent army. The FBI said on Thursday that foreign government hackers have broken into U.S. healthcare and research companies conducting research into COVID-19. The FBI spokesperson did not name any specific countries or organizations. A Hubei resident has publicly filed a lawsuit against the Chinese regime for its role in the pandemic. It's the first case of its kind in China. NTD Xu Wenrong has the details. A Hubei resident says the government knew the virus could be passed between humans long before it announced it. The cover-up resulting in many lost lives. Someone needs to take responsibility for this epidemic. It's a very serious matter. As a Hubei citizen, I think it's necessary to stand up and tell the Hubei provincial government to take responsibility. Tan Jun works for a theme park in Hubei. On the morning of April 13th, he filed a complaint against the Hubei provincial government. He became the first person in China to file a lawsuit against the government for the spread of the CCP virus. In his complaints, he said, according to the state-issued investigation report of Li Wenliang case, human-to-human transmission had occurred by December 2019. However, Hubei Health Commission stated on January 11, 2020, no medical personnel found infected. No clear evidence for human-to-human transmission. They obviously downplayed the situation. He added the Hubei government's cover-up led to the fast spread of the virus, which overwhelmed hospitals and ICUs. Many patients didn't have a chance to get diagnosed or treated. Many people died, including a lot of medical staff. (laughs) Ultimately, the entire province was locked down. The loss of human lives and economy is unprecedented. The complaint states two demands. First, the Hubei provincial government must make an apology in the Hubei Daily newspaper. Second, the defendant, the provincial government, pays all legal costs. Many Hubei residents support him. However, they are not optimistic about whether he can succeed. Everyone should stand up. Every local government should take responsibility. Not just Hubei province, but the entire Chinese government should take responsibility. Of course we support the lawsuit. The problem is that the government doesn't care. In other countries, you can sue the government. But how's that possible in China? The police will come looking for you. The police summoned Tanjun the night he filed the lawsuit. They told him to write a letter promising not to post anything related to the lawsuit online. And it's not just in China. Countries around the world are now calling out the Chinese regime for its role in the pandemic. A UK-based think tank advising countries to take legal action against the CCP for its cover-up. On April 3rd, a U.S. congressman introduced a bill that would make it easier for Americans to take legal action on their own. Reporting by Yuning and Xu Wenrong, NTD News. Governments around the world are becoming increasingly frustrated with China's lack of transparency around the CCP virus. U.S. leaders want the truth on how it originated, and they're asking if it leaked from a lab in Wuhan. Leading political figures are demanding China come clean about the beginnings of the novel coronavirus or CCP virus. America and other countries now asking if the virus actually came from a lab in Wuhan. I will tell you, uh, more and more we're hearing the story, and we'll see. Just 10 miles from the seafood market in Wuhan, where the CCP says the virus originated, is one of the largest infectious disease labs in the world. It's known to house coronaviruses. The U.S. says its investigations are so far inconclusive, and opinion is divided in the scientific community. The majority of the views right now is, is that it is natural, that it was organic. But I think we need to continue to work this. And once we get beyond the pandemic, we'll have a chance to look back and really find out what happened. China denies the virus came from the lab, but isn't allowing independent investigators in to check. This kind of secrecy has frustrated governments around the world as they struggle with the pandemic. 
many criticizing the regime for covering up the outbreak by silencing whistleblowers and censoring the media. We can't have uh, one of the largest nations in the world uh, hiding information or not being uh, transparent when it comes to helping us deal with this. And the dissatisfaction with China is bipartisan. 90% of Republicans and almost 70% of Democrats say the Chinese regime is responsible. The UK's acting Prime Minister Dominic Raab said Thursday it won't be business as usual with China after the pandemic. Australia's Home Affairs Minister echoing that sentiment Friday. I do think uh, there will be a reset about the way in which the world interacts with China. We do want more transparency. When you've got a Communist Party that doesn't have the transparency that other comparable economies have, then that is a problem. French President Emmanuel Macron also casting doubt on the CCP's official story on Friday. He says it's naive to think China has handled things better than the West and that many things happen there that we don't yet know about. In a chorus of calls for a review of the World Health Organization, leaders of G7 nations and Republican lawmakers all hold the same view, that the WHO mishandled the CCP virus crisis. The White House said in a statement that leaders of the G7 nations called for a thorough review and reform of the World Health Organization. President Trump led a video conference with the G7 leaders on Thursday, their first meeting in a month. The video conference was held to discuss plans for each nation's recovery. According to the White House, much of the conversation centered on the lack of transparency and chronic mismanagement of the pandemic by the WHO. Following President Trump's criticism of the WHO this week, Republican lawmakers suggested that the UN agency's director general should resign. Seventeen Republicans on the House's Foreign Affairs Committee wrote a letter supporting the halt of U.S. funding to the WHO. They wrote that funding should not resume until Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus resigns. In the letter, the 17 congressmen said they had lost faith in Tedros. They said they blamed the Chinese Communist Party and the WHO for mishandling the epidemic that led to a global pandemic. President Trump said previously the WHO has promoted China's disinformation about the CCP virus. What's more, also on Thursday, a group of eight Senate Republicans called for an international investigation into the organization and the origins of the virus. And Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today agreeing. He says there are issues with the WHO and Japan will review its funding after the pandemic is resolved. Close to 700,000 Americans are confirmed to have the CCP virus, the U.S. suffering more than 34,000 deaths. But nearly 60,000 people have recovered, and there are signs the country overall is improving. Many states are mapping out their plans for reopening, with some starting today. NTD's Melina Weiskup brings us the latest. Trump offered guidance on a phased approach to reopening yesterday. We're nearly 30 percent of our country have reported no new cases in the last seven days. But he says the final decision is still each state's to make. Some states are wasting no time in making those decisions. Jacksonville, Florida reopened its parks and beaches today, but people still need to follow social distancing. Texas is set to open their retail stores and state parks next week. I have formed a statewide strike force to open Texas. But some states aren't quite ready. For one, Mississippi extended its stay-at-home order. One more week of vigilance. One more week of sheltering in place. It's working. Ohio will start reopening on May 1st. Michigan's governor said she's hopeful the state can reopen by May 1st, too, as they've seen fewer new cases lately. Michigan residents are eager, and some have been protesting, urging the governor to reopen sooner. There are ongoing protests in a handful of other states, too. Even as more states start easing restrictions, reopening in most states doesn't include schools. According to an Education Week report, over half of U.S. states have either ordered or recommended schools stay closed for the rest of the academic year. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And governors from the Midwest take action for the economy. They're joining together to coordinate efforts to reopen their states for business. The bipartisan group of governors announced the move on Thursday. Together, their Midwest Regional Partnership will work to restart the local economy. The states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Kentucky, 
and Indiana will work in close coordination to reopen our economies in a way that prioritizes workers' health. The partnership will allow the governors to share data and advice. We will make decisions based on facts, science, and recommendations from experts in healthcare, business, labor, and education. The group says it will be most effective if states work together to phase in sectors of the Midwest economy. But Wisconsin Governor Tony Everett says that doesn't mean every state will reopen all at once. We can't think of this like flipping a light switch. It's like turning a dial. The more disciplined we are now, the faster we can turn it. The Midwestern Alliance joins PACs on the West Coast and in the Northeast, announced earlier this week. Altogether, the 17 states covered by the partnerships are home to nearly half the country's population. And New York is seeing another drop in total hospitalizations. It's a good sign, but the governor said he'll need more help from the federal government to open the state. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more. Total hospitalizations are down in New York State, and as of Friday, over 218,000 have tested positive and over 10,900 have died from the CCP virus. Governor Cuomo laid out steps to open the state up, large-scale testing, and money rank high, things he said they don't have enough of. So Cuomo is asking the federal government for funding. The federal government cannot wipe their hands of this and say, oh, the states are responsible for testing. We cannot do it. We cannot do it without federal help. Because tax revenue is plummeting, he said the state would need 10 to $15 billion to ramp up its virus testing. But President Trump said on Thursday that there are enough tests to go around. As Dr. Burks has been advising our governors for weeks, we continue to have an excess testing capacity of 1 million tests per week available for use in our Capabilities are growing every single day, especially with the new tests that are coming onto the market rapidly. Cuomo is also calling for funding from the federal government to help pay for the state's public services. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. A Minnesota state senator and doctor expresses his concerns about the CDC's new guidelines for counting deaths. He said in an interview, physicians don't like it when politicians try to impact patient care. The CDC says local health departments should start counting death in two categories, confirmed and probable. That's the reason New York City's death count nearly doubled this week. Wyoming and Ohio yesterday also began counting probable deaths. Senator Dr. Scott Jensen said hospitals also have an incentive to do so. They get nearly triple the funding for seeing patients who have the CCP virus. The movie industry is taking a big hit from the shutdowns, especially theaters like AMC. The box office is now seeing a 25 percent drop in revenue since the start of the year. The pandemic is ravaging the film industry. Theaters are closed and movie production is halted. Reports predict this year's box office sales could fall over 40 percent compared to last year. Film marketing CEO Mark Becker tells us how the change is affecting him. It's no doubt that box office is going to be off this year. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, a year ago last weekend, I think the box office did a couple hundred million. This weekend it did less than $5,000 or around there. I mean, of course, uh, we're definitely seeing a slowdown from some of our clients. There's not just uncertainty with the box office, but also uncertainty about their jobs. Um, you know, Disney, for example, if you're seeing the layoffs or a lot of the agencies across the industry. Disney's market cap dropped over $60 billion or 25 percent since mid-February. The company has had to furlough many employees that work for its movie companies, including Marvel and Pixar. And AMC lost 70 percent of its stock value since the start of the year. Chinese conglomerate Dali and Wanda took the company over in 2012 in a $2.6 billion deal. Wanda's theaters in China are still closed amid the outbreak. The word on Wall Street is that AMC theaters may be headed towards bankruptcy, with some analysts saying it might not survive the shutdowns caused by the pandemic. The brand marketing expert says movie theaters may need to come up with some new ideas like virtual reality or a more immersive experience to stay in business once the lockdowns are lifted. Meanwhile, viewership on streaming sites like Netflix are on the rise. Uh, Netflix is very, is, isn't too open about sharing their data, but streamers have seen a huge, a huge boost. I mean, Disney Plus just, just passed 50 million subscribers and, and, and they're absolutely, you know, blowing past their projections, which is phenomenal. Netflix is, whether it's, the, whether it's Tiger King fever or any of the other, uh, any of the other stories on their platform. 
Becker says film companies are struggling to get people into theaters already, and the pandemic is making it worse. This as we enter the new normal and the economy progressively reopens. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. The UK has recently extended its nationwide lockdown, but one expert says the country's measures came too late and that the sluggish response may cost a high price. A public health expert in the UK says the country might suffer over 40,000 casualties by the time the pandemic is over. According to him, the government was too slow in imposing measures to prevent its spread. This as Britain recently extended its lockdown for another three weeks. As the Italian economy gets worse, people are seen waiting for local food handouts. Organized by charities, the service is usually reserved for the homeless and poorest members of the community. The people in line described themselves as being destroyed and said they wouldn't know where to find food if it wasn't for the charity. Europe's largest economy is also facing hard times. Germany's economy minister said the country is facing its most grave economic situation since World War II. The French army reported that the virus has found its way onto an aircraft carrier. Almost 50 percent of the staff who were deployed on the military vessel tested positive. And East African countries are fighting a war on two fronts. Efforts to contain a second locust invasion are in full force, despite restrictions on movement of personnel and equipment due to the virus. The desert locust is considered the most destructive migratory pest in the world. Around 20 million people are already experiencing acute food insecurity. A father in Shanghai, China, has taken a creative and adorable approach to keeping his toddler safe. He designed an inflatable suit for his two-year-old son, meant to fend off the virus, though it's not yet clear whether it's effective. Under different circumstances, it would appear that this family dressed up their toddler as an astronaut for the day, even mimicking the conditions of low gravity. But actually, it's a protection suit, made to keep him safe from virus infection. I hope my son can wear it amid the epidemic, and I hope to provide him with total protection in isolation. Tao, the boy's father, designed the suit himself. He ordered the inflatable suit online and then added some modifications, including a filter and a device that monitors air. People passing by adore the look. I think it's great. He looks like a cartoon character. But some express doubt that the suit works. It's cute for sure, but I'm not sure how the filter works and if it really can offer protection. Besides filtering air, Tao says that the suit will also prevent his son from touching his face, which could lead to pathogens entering the body. And with people attending school classes remotely, many different environments have now become classrooms. One young boy in Italy studies amid particularly unusual surroundings. With schools in Italy closed, many students are turning to online classes to keep up with their education. But online classes do require an internet connection, something a 12-year-old Italian boy living in Tuscany's countryside doesn't have at home. Giulio, who doesn't want to miss out on his education, has found a solution. Every day, Giulio and his mother drive to the middle of nowhere, to a certain spot on a hill under a tree. There, his mother's phone gets just enough signal to act as a router for their tablet. With it, he can access the classroom app and continue with his studies. On the days when I have lessons, I bring from home a table, a stool and my bag with a tablet and all the books that I need. And then my mom and I come up here with the car. We set everything up and we are ready for our lessons. Out in the open field, it's not the same as within the walls of a living room. Studying under the Italian sun may be beautiful, but it can also be distracting at times. Most of the time I can concentrate well, but it also happens that I'm talking and you can hear the bleating of a goat behind me. But Giulio won't study outside forever. His family's home internet is already being fixed, and he'll soon return to attending his online classes from his living room, like his fellow students. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased information. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates. See you tomorrow.